This is the Project Camp Lot with the Blower Radio, and we are broadcasting from points unknown. So hopefully this broadcast will be uh, uneventful, as they say, and, and everything will work out just fine. We have a very interesting guest tonight. His name is Bill Calder, and I am going to more or less let him introduce himself. I've actually met with him for a while on various occasions, and we've got a link on the front page to one aspect of his work, which is as an author. And this is a pseudonym, uh, michaellindsayblog.com is the link, and we're going to just go with that for now. He's a, a very complex individual and let's see saying he's the author of day trading for a living and also trading in the s p and also currency trading for a living he's a former currency and bond trader through 1992 and there was a, a learning platform that enabled a wealth of knowledge to be acquired about two worlds of commercial banking and investment banking. I'm going to say that this is purposely vague and that this individual has had his hand in, in many things. I, I know you're really something of a financial expert, but also something unconventional, I guess, in the, in the financial arena <laughs> as well. So uh, I hope you can lend some of your expertise to, to the situation here. I know people are you know, a lot of people are hurting financially. I know you have some interesting philosophies, and you also have writing in a president, ten, presidential candidate, uh, which we can also discuss if you're up for that. Uh, so it's sure. really up to you. Okay, well, let's basically start with, I think the first simple question is, what type of map monetary platform is being utilized here in the country? And when you analyze and take a look at the basic monetary platform that we utilize, it is what is known in the banking world as a debt-based banking platform. Now, what that means is, is that for every unit of medium, and understand that medium is money, for every unit of medium that is issued, there is an equal unit of debt issued. That is what determines the underlying value of the currency. Now. That debt is issued by the treasury of a sovereign nation, and that sovereign nation obligates its citizens to forfeit a portion of their labor rewards in order to pay off the principal and interest of that debt obligation. And that's the basis of money. Um, that platform has been around since the early 800s and has you know, evolved into what we now see in the world today. In the 70s, when Nixon was in office, I thought one of the most brilliant maneuvers was put into play, and it allowed the United States to become, in the eyes of the world, as the world's currency reserve. They supplanted the British sterling, or the pound, okay? And that was done by creating an agreement and an entity called OPEC. And I thought what Nixon and those boys did was brilliant. They became the most powerful monetary system on the planet. And you have to then take a look at what's actually happened, how they created what they call a transaction processing system that allows you today to basically complete a transaction in nanosecond using the internet okay uh well uh, before we kind of jump into all of this bill what i'd love you to do is talk a little bit about yourself because the listeners will be interested to know you know who you are and and a little bit more than what your bio said because i have to say it was extremely vague um, well i typed it up in like 30 seconds for you because i didn't have one <laughs> okay so I basically appreciate- i'm a young man from the east coast I started when I was 16 years old as a ticket runner on the New York Stock Exchange. There I learned how specialists and traders operated the market from the inside. And it was fabulous learning how to run the tickets and see who was in charge and how they did things. From there, I went to college up at Syracuse University, left college, went into the military as an officer or Marine, Spent a wonderful period of time there and was actually going to make the military my lifelong career until 
um, a young lady that I was seeing got pregnant. And then it became difficult to try to explain to a young girl who was my daughter that her father ran around as a soldier killing people. I, so I, I decided to change professions. And I had a choice at that time to either join the administrative side of the military because I had got accepted to USC to go to law school and stay in the military or choose another path. And I got an offer from a firm out of New York to go to work on Wall Street. And I became a currency and bond trader and eventually a fund manager inside a major NYSE firm. I left that firm in 1992 with one of, and I was listed as one of the top 10 currency and bond traders during my period of service there on the planet. Uh, to me, it was a very easy business to do. It's real simple because it's run by humans, and if you understand human beings or are able to read them, you can figure out what their next move is going to be. And that's how I traded. And <laughs> I did very, very well with it, to say the least. I still trade today, um, but I, after I left Wall Street, I became a small businessman, you know, buying small businesses. I've owned a couple clubs, a small publishing company, a few little business ventures, real estate. I own some property, and, um, and I have an on-site property manager that manages all those and collects rents for me. So I've been successful in certain areas within the economic system that we all have to live in. And I've, I have found a way to navigate my way in and out of this. And then I got bored because I didn't have all the adrenaline rushes and I, <laughs> <laughs> that you had either in the military on assignments or running around, you know, <laughs> trading blocks of $10 million at a time. Uh, and I had a friend who at that time which was with the firm called E.F. Hutton, and he called me up and he said he wanted me to look at some of the investments he had made, and they were in the currency market, and I took the time to look at his tickets and his statements and you know, did a workup and said, whoever's giving you this information is lying to you because the market didn't hit these prices on these days. I don't know where they're getting them from. What exchange are they making these trades on? It, they're definitely not making it through the commercial bankers, the Forex, or any of the exchanges that will do this business with these type of contracts. And it turned out that he was a victim of a large fraud, a Ponzi scheme. I was able to track his money to help one of my old military buddies and we were able to save all of his funds and his reputation as a VP with E.F. Hutton. He was one of the few that escaped the big Dominelli fiasco bankruptcy here in Southern California, which caused, you know, it toppled the mayor of San Diego, the mayor of Del Mar. It really led into a big mess and all because of that little investigation that I had done. That led to somebody else calling me from New York, another person from Miami. Before I knew it, we were hunting down what we called security fraudsters that embezzled money and had shipped it overseas. And for a number of years, I was basically back in the military chasing bad guys. And I absolutely loved it. I got to do all, buy all kinds of electronic snooping devices, and I had a great team. And we captured a lot of bad people, recovered a lot of money for investors, and I wasn't trading in the market taking anybody else's money from them anymore. And I was still living just as good, and I was getting my adrenaline rushes at the same time. Now I'm retired. A number of years back, I decided to pursue another career, and uh, um, I have, you know, in my opinion and several others, develop the craft of writing and telling stories. A number of years back, in 1982, we as a group, and I was head of the Merchants Association here in Southern California, we ran a particular candidate for Congress on the Republican primary ticket. We had the endorsements of the Republican powers that be, 
and 60 days out, they changed their endorsement to his opponent, who had donated $7 million to the Republican Party. We lost the primary. Being very upset as we were, we felt the best candidate was the man we were supporting. That particular candidate's name was Ron Packard. Ron said to us at our meeting after the announcement of the election and the count that, you know, he was sorry it didn't work out, but he wished we could figure out a way to win the election. And he looked at me and said, come on, you're an analyst, you're a former trader. He says, my goodness, he says, if anybody can figure out a tactical solution to this, you should. So see what you can come up with. And I did. I started looking at it and I discovered some things and I found some very interesting things after perusing all the different campaign manuals that were out there. And I presented what I consider to be a viable tactical alternative to the two party candidate system. And it was by utilizing the write in vote. I had uncovered through my research a psychological study done by the Columbia group of doctors and, you know, teachers and professors and their, their assistants that studied voters. And it said that 74% of the voting public does not make up their mind until they walk into the voting booth. And that of that 70%, plus almost all of them remember the last thing they saw. And that's the first thing that they were doing. So I presented my tactical plan and our candidate Ron said, that's great. Okay, we're, we're going to have to break in here. I'm sorry, we're going to commercial. This okay. is great. Thank you so much. And we'll be right back with Bill Calder. Project Camelot, Whistleblower Radio, and we're talking to Bill Calder. Uh, he has a very unorthodox approach, both to putting a president in office and also uh, the financial world, as well as other aspects of living, I would say. Bill, do you want to continue where you left off in regard to kind of setting the scene there? Right. So where I left off was, so after our meeting and I had presented the tactical plan to run for office as a write-in candidate, I had basically shown the committee, the campaign committee, the election committee, that this could be won. Um, and here was a list of all the things that had to be done. And But there was an item on the list that... I had no idea how to get done. And our candidate said, oh, that's the only thing I could have figured out because I know how to do that. And I said, great, let's do it. We raised $456,000 and between the Republicans and the Democrats, they spent $9 million, And our guy won over 63% of the vote as a write-in candidate, the second candidate in the history of Congress to win as a write-in. It taught us some very interesting things. We got in trouble with the powers that be. We had a meeting with the Bush group down at the hotel, Coronado, and you know we were basically instructed that and told that, hey, what you guys did is you exposed an underbelly of the two-party system and that we're not gonna tell you you can't do that because we were bragging there at the Thousand Plate Dinner that we were in attendance that uh, you know, we could get a homeless man elected to any office. We had figured out how to win an election regardless and not have to spend millions of dollars on media. <clears throat> and they basically explained to us that you shouldn't do that. You need a two-party betting system so that you can bet the candidates that are running for office so the wrong people don't get in. Well, we disagreed and they informed us that we shouldn't disagree and we needed to learn why and we went through a process where you know between the audits and getting tickets we couldn't drive around the street without having an officer following us until we capitulated and Mel and I did and we got someone else elected into office using our method and we were just absolutely livid that the public was so stupid that they would elect a drug addict musician who was getting stoned when we interviewed him to office. And we wanted nothing to do with the public or 
politics after that. <laughs> it, yeah, and we just basically we just basically walked away. We ran a few businesses, Mel and I, and we stayed away from the. We did you know some local things um, with the Merchants Association. I authored the Fiscal Responsibility Act, which saved several communities um, here in Southern California from this last um, fiscal fiasco we went through. But we basically stayed away, and and I was having fun chasing bad guys that stole money that hid it overseas. And I just you know I wouldn't. I actually stopped voting, and and then Mel contracted diabetes, had to sell his businesses here in Southern California, and moved up to Northern California, and then. Um, you know, went into a diabetic coma and died. Nine months later, his lawyer shows up, who's a friend of mine, at my door and hands me letters from Mel. And basically, Mel says that he and I screwed up. We made the wrong decision, that our country's in trouble, and that we need to notify our children and our children's children on how to take on the system. And we need to rethink our processes because he believed that the powers who talked us into doing what we did and they hoodwinked us and I thought about it for almost a year I mean I gave it a lot of thought and I said you know how the hell am I going to tell everyone that this is how you win and how am I going to teach them about the monetary system and the platform most people don't even know that our Federal Reserve Bank is a privately owned you know, entity and trying to explain to people what's going on, it's its not easy. They, uh, it's just not, it's very, very difficult. And so I thought about it for a very, very long time and I called some friends and I did some research again and I said, you know, there's a possibility here and this is how it has to be done. A Corona Awaits was created, Centurion Press took it on, I used the pseudonym, my brother, my deceased brother's name, Michael, and I used my middle name as the last name, Michael Lindsay, and I penned A Throne Awaits. And in A Throne Awaits, I gave away all the secrets on how to win a write-in campaign, how to run one, how to win it, and I exposed the underbelly of the monetary system and how to fix it. And and I put it out there. It, the book did very, very well in the Far East and in China. Um, but in the United States, it hasn't taken hold. People are scared, I think. Uh, they're, we're in a financial situation right now, and nobody knows what's going to happen from one day to the next. I still, to this day, monitor the currency volumes of 12 major countries and how their currencies are traded and the volume of open interest contracts that are available on the Forex. And I watch every day what's going on. I start every morning at five o'clock. It's been a habit for so long, I can't stop. And I still trade once in a while and I scalp a little bit of money from them <laughs> just because it's fun <laughs> beating them up. And I, I'm very good at it <laughs> and I like taking it from them. But, you know, they take 57% between the state and the feds in taxes. So, I mean, making, you know, an extra $10,000 a day may seem like great money to a lot of people, but when you lose, you only get um, 4700 of it. You know, it's that's really not a lot of fun. <laughs> but it, uh, well, I, 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 I trade I mean, that just because I like beating up the market maker because I understand what they're doing and I can see what they're doing. Well, Bill, uh, I, I like your unorthodox uh, approach to paying taxes. Do you want to share that? Right. If you take, a, if you sit down and you take a look at uh, our tax system and how it's set up, it's it's really simple. They have set up a method whereby you think by saving taxes you take exemptions or you apply for this or you utilize this program based on a form and a number that they've given you. When you do that, you allow them the opportunity to audit you. When I file my tax returns every year, I do not even claim myself as an exemption. I pay the maximum rate clear across the board, no questions asked. 
Therefore, I am exempt from an audit because I did not take any deductions. The only thing they are allowed to do is notify me that they are going to open a criminal investigation because I failed to report any earnings, which I don't. And they can't do that. And I learned that after going through an audit once. You know, after what happened after the 90, the 82 election and going through that audit, it's not, it's not a fun thing to do. They can make your life really miserable when that 800 pound gorilla starts jumping on you. You're like, what are you talking about? You know, and they're like, well, we believe this. Huh? Believe what you want. It's not true. You proved to us it's not true. Wait a minute. Don't you have to prove that that is true? No, it's not when it comes to the monetary system and how they have things set up. So I learned from a really astute attorney, look, it, if you don't ever want to go through this again, this is what you have to do. It sucks, but that's what you do. You don't. You fill out a 1040 EZ and you just report maximum income every single dime. I don't care if you sold a trash can as extra stuff for $10 and you deposited it in your account, you better report it, okay? And just pay the maximum amount. Therefore, they can't do anything to you anymore, okay? And that's the way our system is set up. Our system is currently set up inside a debt-based platform. And that is the value of our money. Our, and I call it medium. So do all the bankers, by the way. They call it medium. How do you, as a citizen, Carrie, figure out how to stop this? Well, uh, uh, you know, you're asking me something that, that, that I, I, I wouldn't know, but, but I think people will find it very fascinating, <laughs> your, well, your approach. So how, do you, how do you do that? Well, has there been any more candidates who have won as a write-in? Has the Republicans and the Democrats supposed any member of their party who then ran as a write-in since 1982? Yes. Ron Paul was opposed by the Republican Party in Texas, ran as a write-in, and won utilizing the method. Okay? Murkowski in Alaska just won, and the method that they used was they passed out little bracelets with her name printed on there because, you know, Paul is easy to remember to spell, and so is Packard. Murkowski is a little bit more of a job, and if you don't print the name correctly in the write-in space on the ballot, they get to discount that vote and not count it. And even though people have the bracelet on their wrist, she still lost 10% of the vote because they misspelled her name in the ballot, in the ballot, in the poll. I mean, it's just awful. You know, so those are things that you have to deal with. But the public, by and large, will. If you ran a good, solid campaign, you can get elected as a write-in candidate. Now, what are you going to do once you get in office? There's only one thing we need to do to fix all of our problems, and that is to remove the creation of interest debt at the inception of our medium or money. You remove that, you no longer have a deficit, and you no longer deal with cycles of inflation and deflation. But if you do that, you also remove the power from the individuals that currently have it to create that medium, and they no longer will be able to control all of industry and commerce. And if you realize that, you're going to say, wow, they're not going to let that go that easily. And they're not. But you can do it just by electing one senator or a president. It only takes one senator or a president to do that. There was one president who tried to do it in the early 60s, and he didn't get to serve out his full term in office. But he you did mean sign. Yes. And he, but he did sign an executive order to put an end to what was going on. And that order, executive order, is still in effect today because no sitting president since him has ever rescinded it. And, but nobody has ordered it executed and followed through with. It's a rather interesting dilemma. And I mean, I have spoken with friends that I have that work and live inside the bureaucracy in Washington, D.C., and they said, 
their statement to me is real simple. It is not a subject that is allowed to be discussed. It is taboo. If you fight the Fed, you sign your own epitaph. And it's true with anybody who's come out against it. Anybody who comes out against the Fed is gone. Okay. Uh, well, under the circumstances, let's, let's fast forward to today. Okay, so what do we do today? We've got an election pending, and we've also got uh, something of a, of a crash. I don't know what you might call it. Some kind of major downturn in, in the U.S. economy at the least, and certainly Europe as, as well. Correct. How do you view all of that? How do I what? View all of that. Well, you have to take a look at the amount of debt that's created, okay? This is something that I've never seen before, and this is, you know, since this is my area and I follow it regularly, it started back in 19, I mean, in 2007, and I watched it happen through 2008 to where we are today, okay? For the first time in the history of the Federal Reserve, the amount of debt that is outstanding exceeds the amount of money circulation. So, Bill, you were in midstream there, and so I want you to be able to pick up where you left off. Uh, so, so go right ahead. <coughs> All right. So, the one of the uh, interesting things that I follow that's ver- that I, I I'm very astute about this because I just I just it helps me make decisions when I I trade in the currency markets. And the Federal Reserve and the Treasury list the amount of debt and the amount of medium in circulation. And you have to know how to read those statements and reports. These are very emboldened individuals who are telling everybody the truth. They literally are telling you what they're doing. And unless you understand them, you are victims of what they're up to. Now, the United States government currently has an excess of 15.3 trillion in debt, and there's only 13.6 trillion in medium or money available. So if we wanted to retire our debt, we couldn't. We'd still be in debt. This has never happened since 1913 when they first created the central bank. They've never done this before, ever. It is and so there's a reason why they're doing it, um, and it, it's not good. I believe that they're pushing the system to the brink of shutting it down, and what they're going to replace it with is you know, there's all kinds of guesses out there, and unless you're one of them or have been in one of their meetings, you really don't know, but I believe they're going to install a new debit credit system that is fully electronic. And it's catching on, it's caught on in Europe. Um, and I and it's now catching on in here. And they, I believe they found the tool um, to actually implement it and get the American public off of holding hard currency in their pocket. And I, I got to see it Monday night and I was just laughing up a storm and nobody could understand why I was laughing. And I said, oh my goodness, they found a way to get you at the bottom of the economic run involved in a debitless, cashless system. They had their new smartphones and on it were these little white boxes and they were selling their tricking, little trinkets. And all you had to do was swipe your credit or debit card right on their phone. <laughs> And I was cracking up. I said, oh, my goodness, that's fabulous. It's a fabulous plan. It's going to, from a public relations standpoint, I think they're going to win over well over 70% of the public. And because I saw three of them Monday night, and I bet you by next Monday night, when I go to our little social gathering, there'll be three to five more and every week. And I saw it happen with the iPhone. One person came in with the first iPhone, and in less than a year, all but four of us out of 87 who get together every Monday night had a smartphone. I still don't have one. I'm still one of the old guys. But they okay. all have them now, and it's rather interesting. It just, boom, swept right through. It took less than 12 months before they all got one. Okay. I, what I want to do here, Bill, is uh, 
is we are uh, coming into the second hour pro- shortly, and I want people to be able to call in and ask you questions. I think there'll be a lot of people out there that like would like to talk to you uh, because you have a very interesting twist on things and a way of looking at the world. And uh, and our phone number just for the callers is two one eight three three nine eight five two five. And I'll repeat that it's two one eight three three nine. 8525, and I imagine it's also on the American Freedom Radio website uh, where you can can see it there. But if you want to call in, uh, we'll, we'll take callers uh, on this part of the hour as well as in the second hour of the show. But in terms of looking at the situation that you're looking at, how are you feeling about, you know, I mean, I think you and I both know that both candidates are run by Bush, Right. Yes, there is a controlling interest behind that, um, and I, I, there are a lot of individuals that label the Bush, and they call them the Bush, the Bush cabal. They label them as the powers that be, and they're not. They are an upper-level management group, for sure, okay? But they, are, they do not have the final say. What everybody doesn't understand, and you've got to understand, I come from a different perspective than the average individual. Um, I come from that 1%. I come from that world where those people live. I lived with them. I went to school with them. Um, I grew up with them. And, you know, I did business with them. Uh, I managed some of, the, some of their monies at one time. And they were very upset when I left. When you take a look at the banking system, there is a council that sits in Basel, Switzerland, that controls all of the central banks and all the nations that have adopted the central banking format, okay? And if you take a look at history, history, in my opinion, we are human beings. We have a tendency to repeat our mistakes of the past. The United States is repeating the same mistakes that Britain did before they lost their right and their power that they had as the world's currency reserve. Um, Nixon was part of that group, so was the Bushes, um, but there were others involved and they were taking their orders from that particular banking council. We are doing the same thing. No, Bill, are you referring to the city of London? No, the city of London is, is the central exchange for a a particular precious metal, okay, known as gold, what everybody refers to as gold. The value of money uh, amongst the central bankers is based on the issuance of debt, okay? Although most bankers that are at that upper level keep anywhere from 20 to 30% of their reserves in precious metal. And there has been a power play if you take it back, if you go back to when I was in the business and working with on Wall Street, we believed as investment bankers on Wall Street that we had come up with the solution to challenge the money creators and the central bankers. If you remember, we created the Wall Street bankers created what is known as a money market fund. If you control depositors, you then control a capital formation platform that allowed you to then capitalize and control a segment of industry. And I used to tip my stepbrother used to tell me, "You're wrong. We have we will eventually own you." And it wasn't long ago when he called me up and he said. Ha, 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 you owe me a dollar. Our bet was that we would never own you, and now we own all of you. Give me my dollar. And I did. I sent him a thank you card for the bet with one dollar in it. Now, my stepbrother is the CFO for the Rockefeller Group. So... I can't believe earned, you're so you're saying this on the radio, huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And so they were right. He was right. 
And when I go back and I look and I study and I read about certain things, I sat there and go, oh my goodness, yes. If I remember my meeting with Nelson and I remember some of my other meetings back in New York, I sit there and go, and in Washington, they were correct that he who issues or has the authorization to issue the medium, and they don't call it money, the medium controls all of commerce and industry. And they're right, they do. Okay, you can, can, you, and, can, you, can you answer one question in regard sure. to, uh, my understanding is China is in control of printing our money at this time. Does that give them a certain power? They're not in control of it. Okay, but it's, it's interesting you bring that up because last month the most interesting thing happened. I don't know if you're aware of it or you read about it, but China announced if you go outside the United States, they do not call. Okay, well, I'm sorry. We've got a commercial. You're going to have to be right back. Carrie uh, Cassidy, Project Camelot Whistleblower Radio. We're talking to Bill Calder. And he is a, a financial, uh, well, something of an expert in the area of the fi of finance, but also uh, <laughs> very much a nonconformist in, in multiple ways, in ways he's not even telling us, <laughs> which I know behind the scenes. But w right before the break, we were we started to get in the subject bill of, of China and and what's going on there. Uh, and, and I really would like you to go down that road. So can you explain to us? what you were sort of talking to me offline uh, about. Okay, yes. Last month, um, on September 6th, China announced that any nation who wished to buy oil could do so through a particular exchange. It was called, and it's titled the Kish Exchange, okay? K -I, it's on an island, okay, over there in the Middle East somewhere, okay? Then Russia announced that it would supply any amount of oil for any nation who wanted to buy oil through on the Kiss Exchange. And then Argentina and Brazil joined in, and then India as well. The following Monday, the Japanese finance minister announced that the, the Japanese Treasury was going to drop the U.S. dollar as their reserve currency. They didn't announce what they were going to replace it with, but they announced that they were going to do this. On Friday, he committed suicide and is dead, and now the new guy that's taken over is rescinding that particular edict. <laughs> Which I find really right. interesting. Okay, but here's what China did. Okay, and you have to know and understand your history because we did it to Great Britain. They have basically said that if you are a nation and you want to buy oil and not use the dollar, because you cannot buy oil anywhere unless you use the dollar. Okay. That's why the dollar is the world's currency reserve, because every nation needs to have dollars in their treasury in order to buy oil. That was, is the beginning of the end of the world's currency reserve. Now, in order to monitor how that's going to happen, it doesn't happen overnight. It's going to take several years in order for it to take place. You used to be able to go on to the KISS exchange just on the internet and find out what was up, okay? You can't do that anymore. It's completely blocked out worldwide unless you're there. Unless you're what? Unless you're physically at the KISS exchange, you don't know how many countries are no longer using the dollar to buy oil. They really? will not. They will not make that information available. It's completely blocked. Every internet guru that I have contacted, and two of them are considered the most infamous hackers on the planet, can't get me that data. I want that data, not because, <laughs> not because I, it helps me with my own, and it allows well, no. me. 
Lots of people want that data. Lots it of people. It allows me to deploy a strategy to survive whatever is forthcoming. Okay. Sure. And Absolutely. that's why I want it. Okay, okay, well, that's very interesting. So we've got countries moving off the dollar, the petrodollar, and they're that's not, correct. and and it's a secret process, is what you're saying. They well, it's I don't know, it's if it's secret, but but I know Hillary has been gallivanting around the world as our Secretary of State and rattling its saber. Okay, and you cannot have that happen. Now you have to look at the other side of this. What would happen? If every nation on the planet decided they were no longer going to keep the dollar as their reserve and the yuan, the Chinese yuan became the new world currency, okay? Sounds like a dream to come true to the Chinese. It's, well, don't you think that they fired that shot across our bow by making those announcements and then having Russia back them? And then Russia came out and announced that if the United States were to evade, invade Iran, and and use that as a ploy to shut down the KISS exchange, that it would result in a escalation inside that conflict of nuclear we would have a nuclear escalation in that area. Okay. The, and that was all over Russian TV. Anybody who had um AT and T Uverse or Direct T V and had the uh, Russian TV channels got to see that. Because I have friends that are Russian that called them and said, did you see that the commanding general said that if the United States in <laughs> invades Iran, that it's going to result in a nuclear conflict? He goes, Jesus, what are they going to do, blow us all up? And I said, who cares? If they do, we're not going to feel any pain. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. You know? I mean, well, what else can you what else can you say? Will cooler heads prevail? I think so, because you got to understand the bankers. They're very mundane individuals. Okay, they're very. I mean, just watch Ben Bernanke. You're looking at one of the cool. There's a man that could win any national poker tournament. You couldn't read him if you wanted to. He just is very well trained. Okay. 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 Well. Listen, we have a caller. Would you mind if we, we allow them to ask you a question? Sure. Go right ahead. Okay. Uh, okay, caller, area code 954. Sorry you've been holding a while. Do you want to ask a question? Uh, yeah, I guess I do. Um, I would like for, first of all, I do respect everything I'm listening to tonight. Terry, it's a great show. And um, I want to know what Bill Calder thinks um, of, uh, Benjamin Fulford's uh, take on this from the perspective that I get fr through him are the same power uh, cabal that runs our country in Europe and I know they're fact they're different families that fight uh, supposedly over whatever whatever turf is theirs and they contend with each other but their world is shrinking in terms of the rest of the world like dramatically like India, Russia, uh, China, obviously, um, they seem to have these guys backs to the wall. So doesn't that, doesn't the world's financial picture become just that? It's, it's all tied in as one, I, I guess I'm not sure what the question is outside of what yeah, would you comment I, I think, as far as Ben? I think, Bill, ben, ben. I think Bill is catching the drift. Bill, you want to reply to that? Sure. Listen, um, let, you're right. There are factions that are at odds within the council. If you take a look at the, the major banking council that controls everything, okay, China's part of it. They're part of that um, Far Eastern group, okay, out of Hong Kong, China, uh, the, uh, Korea, that, that whole little section over there, okay, India. They're all part of that section of the council, <clears throat> and they are fighting. They would like to install a monetary system that doesn't enslave everybody and allows the monetary system to further expand and grow and allow ba basically people to prosper, okay? And they're more saving based. If you take a look at the yuan, um, central, uh, the Chinese central bank and the issuance of their yuan, and you compare it to the issuance of their debt, they have three units of medium 
for one unit of debt. They can pay off all the outstanding Chinese debt and still have enough medium in circulation to allow commerce to flow unimpeded in their nation, okay? So people could still continue to deal with themselves and have a medium or money available to allow transactions to take place. What the Chinese did by opening up their borders is they allowed the central bank to export into their nation the transaction processing system. And I got to tell you, there are a lot of individuals who, you know, don't like central bankers, don't like the Federal Reserve and all these bankers and everything else. But you must give them credit for what they've built and developed. And they have built the eighth wonder of the world. Because I can remember as a teenager getting a paycheck and it taking 10 days to clear in the bank. Today, I can take a check from someone and in less than 30 seconds, it's cleared. Okay? Mm. That is an amazing digital form. Then now that system was built, in my opinion, to allow a new currency system. Because you must understand that the current debt platforms and the current monetary systems that we have violate your basic laws of math and exponentials. You cannot have infinite growth and infinite use of resources without replacing them. It doesn't work. It was only built and designed to last a certain number of years, and then they had to come up with an alternative. Their alternative, I believe, is a new centralized issuing system using a cashless system of debit and credit. And what that does is it gives them a, an extra measure of control because if you do not comply within the rules that you are supposed to be governed by, they automatically shut you down economically. And they okay, can do it electronically. Bill, Bill, what I want to do here is, is wrap back. And caller, I don't know if you your question was answered at all there, but I'd well, like to wrap yeah, back. It was, I guess my last question or concern is, um, it does seem like almost common sense to me, and I'm definitely no economist. <laughs> It does seem common sense that it would be easy as hell for everybody on this planet to live not only an extremely comfortable life, but, you know, I mean, it's, it's so ass backwards right now. And, um, and you mentioned that one key word, control. I think that's what it comes down to, and I think that they're going to lose their control in the end, which is not going to be too far from now. That's what I'm hoping. Well, I may be naive, but... Well, let me tell you, I, the battle between the powers that be is over who is going to control transaction processing, okay? I believe that all the parties are going to come to the agreement that the Chinese model, if they stay within a debt-based platform, should be at least three to one. So you cannot issue, so you must issue three units of medium for one unit of debt, okay? I believe that something along those lines will come out, but it's going to be a cashless system I think they're eventually going to install. But I think they're going to do go along those lines, but they are fighting over who gets the transaction fee, okay? Because the transaction fee is where the money's going to be. They're going to, you know, basically, in a, in a mild way, control, give up the right to issue and the more debt than medium and not let these things happen again. And the reason they're going to do that, sir, is because without me and without you and everybody else, they have no system. And they're coming to that realization. But there's, okay. it, it's still we're, wrong. We to, uh, we've got a, a break here. Uh, we're we're going to be right back with Bill Calder. Kara, you're still there? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's it, 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 the whole system on, on what's happening, okay, China has fired their shot, and they're going to try to subplant the U.S. dollar as the world's currency reserve. Okay? Yeah, I think that's obvious to everyone. Now, uh, let me, now, let me ask you a question, okay? Yeah. If you were the power that be, let's say, out of Basel, Switzerland, right, what would you do? Would you allow the Chinese to supplant the U.S. dollar as the world's currency reserve, okay? Well, I see it as a takeover. Uh, 
you know. Right. Now, did when the takeover took place between the United States supplanting Great Britain, was it consensual? Was the American Central Bank following orders from the Europeans? No. They attempted to break away and become what they did. It was a brilliant tactical maneuver, and the United States became the most powerful nation on the planet. Okay, and if you you and you can listen to other people in other parts of the world, they do not. You know, they're upset with America. They call us imperialists now. You know, we're empire builders, and we're taking over the world. Well, that, yeah, that's coming to an end because of some wrong tactical moves that were made by the United States. But what people don't realize is, aside from all the little shenanigans and the little power struggles that are going on, you, you have to look at this planet as a whole entity, okay? And 70% of the world is fed in, from, in, from the produce and products produced inside our 48 states. Is that accurate? Is that a really an accurate That's a fact. That's a fact. That's yeah. very interesting. Okay. So when, and then if you go back and you watch the old, if you listen and hear what's going on, like if you talk to some of the Israeli and, and what's happening, they point blank will tell you that if the rest of the world were to gang up on the United States. Hello. Okay. Now this is definitely, I believe, a commercial. <laughs> Thanks. So we'll be right back with Bill Calder. Project Camelot, this is Lawyer Radio. We're talking to Bill Calder. And Bill, right before the break, we were just getting into some more about what it means if, if China had the uh, reserve currency and the petrodollar was a goner. Can right. you describe where you think that would head? Because I, I'm just going to tell you right out, what I hear you saying is just same goal, same same game, maybe a little uh, sort of looser system or whatever kind of thing, but you're basically talking about one world government and, uh, you know, this sort of cashless society. And it's just with China in control instead of, you know, Rothschild or something. Actually, it, it, it's the same bankers. They'll cut a deal. Um, right. And everybody says, well, how is that possible? And I said, well, you have, to, you have to sit down and you have to take a look at the amount of exports from the United States produce and food to China. If you were to, if the battle wasn't resolved, the amount of people worldwide that would starve to death within 90 days to six months would be horrendous. Okay? And you're not going to have a bunch of hungry bellies um, sitting there idle waiting to die. They're going to revolt. They can't have that. It's just not logical. Um, although I believe that many of the individuals that do sit in control believe there are too many human beings on this planet and would like to see it reduced a little. So the amount of resources that we utilize on this rock we live on will last longer. So, it, which is really, in my opinion, the sad way of looking at things. So, um, right. They have the knowledge, the technology, and the resources to basically allow. Um, the entire planet to be a better place to live. They, but they don't want to give up the right to control. And in order to get that control, they have to have the right to issue the media, the money. Okay, and they have put together a, you know, it was very tactfully laid out. They, it was brilliant when you sit down and you look at it. They did a good job doing what they did. And initially, they were doing things correctly and then they got greedy and now we have well, air, heirs in charge and we have some narcissistic rulers that are in place that are not doing what's best for everyone okay. and can you talk in this about country it? in this country we can fix that in a lot of places they can't do anything about it well that's a that's a loaded statement i i'd like you to go into that but i also want you to talk about what does it mean to have gold-backed currency versus non-gold-backed currency? If you take all the known gold reserve on the planet, there's not enough. Okay. Okay. Well, I've heard the opposite. I've got whistleblower testimony that says gold is so plentiful on this earth, you have no idea. Um, 
Well, it depends on which geological survey report you refer to, okay? And, you know, scientists are off here just like poles are off, <laughs> you know? So it, it, it doesn't it's, matter. It's just like peak oil. I'm like, look at peak oil. Well, My understand. I have whistleblower testimony that says that there are oil reserves in this planet that are absolutely humongous and uh, that they are simply not tapping them because they want to keep the price high. And they want to keep the reins and on, you know, so and so forth. Well, 36 years ago, I sat at a table with my mother, who was the first woman to ever become a president of a subsidiary of a Fortune 500 company. And at that table was the head of Norris Industries, Hess Oil, Black & Decker, Fuller Tool. It was an interesting group, Anderson Brass, and quite a few uh, and they were cutting their little deals, doing what they were doing. And I was complaining, and I asked the guy from Hess Oil, why in the world would you guys allow Nixon to create OPEC and do what you do and stop drilling here? And his comment was real simple. Well, don't you think we ought to have those people over there use up all their natural resources and us buy it with cheaper money that we create out of thin air and save ours. Right. And I was just like, no, why don't we work out a deal so there's enough for everybody? Oh, that's utopia. Don't worry about it. We're not going there. <laughs> exactly. Perfect. And I was just like, and I, I mean, I'm a young Marine officer and I'm just like, mom. And she says, you don't understand business. Okay. But you're going to learn, son. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have, and I did really well, okay? <laughs> and, I agree. And it's been announced. I mean, just look at the reserves that they have found in the Dakotas in Montana. They actually know that there's more oil underground in those three states in the, than in, in the entire Middle East, and we're not drilling it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so we, do, we really don't have, but there is... There is a point when that natural resource will be depleted and it will be on a downhill slide. And you've got several scientific groups arguing um, where that point is, where we start going down the side. Some say we've already passed it. Some say we're not there yet. Okay. But okay, but that's that's actually you know cause, because we're we've got a secret space program, and you know I don't know how knowledgeable you are about that. And the other thing is we've got, you know, they're using free energy. And so oil is a thing of the past. Right. Uh, it's going to be replaced. Yes. I mean, you have a man in in Arizona who can take almost any vehicle, Chevy, GM, or Dodge, Chrysler product, and he can convert any of those cars using the existing fuel injector systems, and your car can run on water. Right. It runs on salt water, you know, and uh, we have one here. It's a, it's a trippy thing, <laughs> you know, and it works, you know. So uh, you have to take a look at all this, but let, let's take a look at the underlying value of money. Currently, we use a debt obligation instrument that's created by the licensed central bank that a, a, a sovereign nation forfeits its right to create its own media, okay? What is the real value of money? Well, money is used to complete a transaction between two parties to the satisfactory conclusion of those parties. So it is just that. It is a medium, okay? Where is the value of that medium? Well, Carrie, if you sat there and, dig it and were to dig a ditch for eight hours a day and got paid $10 an hour, you're the value of that money. It was your energy, your labor, your effort, your will that created the value. So the real value of medium or money are the individuals within that sovereign border that utilize it to create a standard of living that is beneficial. Okay, well, now, let's, let, let's talk about the Iraqi dinar then. If it okay. revalues... Are we going to be talking about it revaluing based on, just as you say, the, the sweat or whatever of, of individuals? 
<laughs> well, I've told it. I've told individuals that are involved in that. <coughs> you know, my personal feeling is that they're not going to allow that to happen this way. I made a small fortune off of the run and the devalue of the peso when it went all the way up over fourteen thousand to one. Fourteen thousand pesos. I'm sitting there and I'm actually in Cancun when all this was happening. And I'm listening to the Minister of Finance at an economic forum at one of the hotels down there in Cancun. I had my entire family down there on a dive trip. And I'm sitting there attending this conference. And all I'm doing is taking notes on the amount of resources and natural minerals that that particular nation has. And I said, well, there's no reason for it. This is crazy that this went up to this. So my natural instinct was then was to take a short position in the peso and i was correct i took a short position at 14100 and got out at 9700 so i made 67% of my money in less than 12 months and if i had leveraged that i would have made you know almost 3000% and i chose not to leverage it i bought you know just a little over $100,000 worth of peso when i was down there and brought it back and okay. had to declare it. Okay, so I, I, I get that you're trying to align this with uh, what's going on right now with regard to the Iraqi dinar. Talk to me about, you know, because I've had so many different discussions with people on both sides of that equation. You know, and, 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 and I think that's a unique situation, okay? You do. Um, on everything that's going on over there. I mean, they talk about the reval. All the servicemen I've talked to that have been over there have been told by the commanders and everything else that if you go home with anywhere from save up your money and buy anywhere from a thousand to five thousand dollars worth of dinar, sit and keep it at home, and you will have X amount of dollars in a certain period of time. Now, this has been going on for well over five or six years now, if not longer, okay, since we first went over there, okay? Now, why? Why would a banker give you 14, 18, 24, 30, 40, 50 dollars for one dinar? Well, okay, what I was told is that it's a financial reset worldwide. Can you buy into that? No. That makes the dinar more valuable than all the European currencies and the North American currencies combined. And well, isn't it possible they revalue it and then they drop it drastically like a rock? Oh, absolutely. And somebody's going to, yeah, because you could all of a sudden be sitting there with all these dollars and instead of paying $3 for a gallon of milk, you're now going to be paying 10 to 15 which I think is coming here in the very near future. Um, I believe because of what they've done, that we're going, their only way from a math standpoint to get, you know, limit some of the mess is to inflate. And, and that's the only thing they know, short of, of dumping the whole system and starting all over again and forgiving, you know, a large portion of the debt, which from a public relations standpoint would go over really well to get all the public to move over to a new monetary system. So they have, and you have to go to the IMF, just go to the IMF's website and look at the IMF website. They have been calling now for over a year to the end of the dollar as the world currency reserve. Now that's the International Monetary Fund. Who runs and funds the International Monetary Fund? 70% of their budget is paid for by the Federal Reserve. Hello? Yeah, so what do you say? So, okay, but, but the, in other words, that's the Fed. So they know their own dollar is going, you know. They've got, yeah, they've taken the steps that they've taken. You that now have to take a look at our economics, our own economic system here in the United States. And the federal government is the largest single employer. So public employees, I think, represent now somewhere between 45 and 47 percent of all the workers um, that are getting some form of government subsidy here in the United States. No nation in the history of recorded history, once it's, once it's hit that 50 percent point, hasn't had a collapse of their economic system and, you know, revolts within 
they're populous. And you're seeing that in Greece. You're going to see that in Spain and a few other places, and and it's growing in elsewhere. They're not going to go. It's 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 just a it's a natural order of things and how things get done before you get change implemented. There are better ways for them to do that, and but, but you can't but, have them do those better ways unless they're willing to give up a portion of their power and control. And if you talk to any of those individuals high enough up, the only thing they care about is the right to issue. That's their holy grail. Without it, they have no power. Okay, when you say the right to issue, who has the right to issue right now? In 1913, we passed the Federal Reserve Act, and we gave it to the Federal Reserve Bank, which is a privately controlled entity. They have the right to issue. Okay, we've got a commercial coming along here. Uh, please hold that thought. We'll be right back with Bill Calder. Hey, Bill? Yes. Okay, so basically, you know, uh, we're, we're kind of running this down here. Uh, I don't know if you wanted to finish your thought from right before the break. Um, yeah. Basically, when you sit down and you look at all the different monetary systems and, and how they're traded, they're controlled by a particular bank called IBS in Switzerland. Okay, And, you know, it, th their history is rather unique, and it dates all the way back to the Crusades. And they've been in control, and they set the exchange rate. And you, if you're a currency trader, you have to pay attention to what they say because it does influence the market in every way, shape, or form. The market can go against, can go against them because people betting that a volume will move in a different direction. But Well, look, I've, I, I've been told that the market is, is completely manipulated. It's controlled by market makers. Do you understand what a market maker is? All right, let me I tell don't you. Know. Not exactly. Okay. It's one of those money, money okay. markets. Uh, the best way to explain it I have found for the general public to understand is almost everybody knows how to make a sport bet with a bookie. Okay? Markets are, are bookies. Markets are central exchanges controlled by bookies. And they take a, a little fee on both sides of the bet. And they operate off a fee. Now, a market maker... He decides which orders are going to be filled. So if you're sitting at a market maker's desk and you're looking at your computer screens and you're looking on the left-hand corner of his screen, which was, I used to be one, so on the left-hand corner of my screen, I would see that there are, we'll say the price of something is $50. I would see that there are a 1,000 orders pending between $50.10 and $50.50, and, and there are 2,000 orders for $49.90 all the way down to $48. I, as the market maker, decide which order gets filled first. I set okay. the price. Okay, but I set who, the line. Who are those guys? Who are those? Uh, those are individuals that work their way up inside the system, okay? that exhibit a particular capability of handle lots of volume of information <clears throat> at a rapid pace. A right. guy that can run a 100-yard dash in 10 seconds or less gets to go to the Olympics. The guy that runs it at 14 doesn't even get to go sit in the seat and watch. Okay, And once you get to that position, you, you go through testing and, and you've traded and you've grasp and demonstrated the ability and have an understanding and then you're taught why things are but you still have a boss and if your boss tells you that don't fill all the sell orders fill only the buy orders for the day because we need the market price at fifty dollars and thirty cents to keep our books balanced that's exactly where the market goes yeah exactly so so the market makers as you call them are being run Correct. Okay. 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 So, are, now, now, there are rebel market makers, okay? But usually what happens is a group of us other market makers gang up on them and overload them to get the market where we want it <laughs> because that's what, we're, that's what we do. Okay. Well, 
Look, I, I have one question. I just put it in the chat here. And I want to apologize to everyone. You know, I have a, a webmaster. He's in Norway. He's he's actually about to fly to the to the U.S. and hopefully be able to work with me here. But, you know, and thank you for donations that have allowed that to happen, although we still need more don donations to keep Camelot alive at this time. But let me say that a person has written in to me and asked a question. I want to be sure to get to, to that question. Okay. And I also want to apologize to people that our chat isn't working. He's not able to fix it right now. And I'm, I apologize for the show because our chat is usually very, very active. People haven't been able to do that. So you were able to call in, but I guess people don't want to make a long-distance call. That's also an issue. Here we've got a question. Do you see physical silver as a way for a big increase, such as values of $500 or higher? Based on the current amount of supply, um, the, the cost to mine an ounce of silver and its current value in the market, there is a possibility and it's a high probability that we will see silver break $125. But before that can happen, and let me preface that, before that can happen, you have to see an expansion of our debt beyond where we are now. And it looks like that's what we're going to do. Which is <laughs> Isn't there going to be another uh, you know, Q4 or 3 or whatever it is? Well, it, it, they're now calling it QE infinitive, so they're not putting a limit on it, okay? <laughs> I believe after China fired their shot across the bow, they've basically told our central banker, this means war. We're not giving up the right to be the world's currency reserve. If other nations um, buy into moving, then what we will do is we'll become an isolation well, this country will become isolated. We will experience for a couple years um, hyperinflation, and then it will calm down and start to deflate, okay? Because we will then force the rest of the world to capitulate. Okay, what about this notion, though, that China wants to, to be the, the new reserve currency? In right. order to do that, they're going to reval the dinar and also the global settlements, and then... Yeah. If like they if, allow that to carry, if they yeah. allow that to go through, yeah, you're going to see China become the world's currency reserve, right. and we we have moved into a, you know, into a new system, and I and, believe that's what they're negotiating right now. Yeah, I, agree. I don't know what it's going to be. I agree, but 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 let me ask you one question because somebody told me an insider, you know, uh, one of my insiders. He told me that one of the motivations for China to get involved like this in, in, in the dinar reval and, and, and the global settlements, acting like a benefactor on the outside, the reality is that what that will do, from what I understand, is make the dollar go down low and that their gold, China has been mining a ton of gold in China. From, this is what I was told and that their gold will then rise in price, and that's their motivation. What do you say to they, that? Yes, they have increased their gold reserves from something like, what, 2,000 metric tons to almost 4,000 now, and that's quite an increase, so they've doubled their, their reserves. So is it possible they want to do even more? Because what's, I, you know, it's interesting because I don't know what their motivation is to get all of, hoard all of that gold. What, what do you think they want it for? Uh, the in order to um, one of the um, methods that the central bankers deploy to discount, you know, attempts to subvert the U.S. dollar, um, and you saw that happen when the North African Union Treaty was put together. Okay, um, that was that was a challenge to the dollar's reserve, and we saw what happened to all the nations that signed on to that agreement okay iran was one of them egypt um syria uh, every nation had signed in with the exception of saudi arabia who withdrew are going through massive problems right now i'm sorry you're 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 sort of muffled what did you say they're going through what they're going through massive problems okay all of them every single one of them it's not funny 
you know, and some people will say that, you know, our intelligence community along with our bureaucracy, you know, um, financed that and, inst- and did all that because Gaddafi, um, you know, the guys out of Iran, um, the guy that we overthrew, we um, invaded Iraq, um, they were the, you know, the figureheads that tried to put together the North African Union. And now take a look at what's happening in those particular countries, especially where they got rid of Gaddafi. The people are now saying, wait a minute, you know, we got rid of our dictator, but we do not want to give up our monetary platform because it's not debt based. We're not going to have to start forfeiting. Okay, uh, you, you know, we're at the end of the show. Uh, I'm very sorry. Uh, Bill, thank you so much for coming on the show. You're welcome, Carrie. Pleasure. <laughs>